if you are talking of what matters to the Yorubas, you will take Ulufalai. If you are talking about what matters to Nigeria, you will take Shehu Yaradwa. And Chief Adedibu looked at me straight in the face and said, until now, I was with Ulufalai. But with what you have said, I will change. And from that day, day he changed and supported Shehu Yaradwa. I can go along, I can go and say more. But one thing I knew about Shehu Yaradwa was that if, and he said that to me, if he wanted to do anything and his father said no, he would come to me if I said no, no matter how important Shehu Yaradwa thought that thing was, he will not do it. That was the respect he gave to me, which is almost equivalent to the respect he gave to his father. One of the problems that Shehu Yaradra gave me when he was doing his politics was one day he was campaigning, I think he's in Akure area or somewhere. And the question was, will he give what he's doing now and yield the position to somebody else? And she said, well, there's only one man in Nigeria he will yield his position to. And that would be me. I didn't know what happened. I didn't know what he said. But I started having streams of people coming to me and say, hey, help us talk to Shehu Yaradwa. Hey, help us talk to Shehu Yaradwa. So one day I called him. I said, Shehu, what has happened? Oh, he said it's because of what I said at my campaign. So what did you say? Then he told me what he said. Oh, I said, well, you have put me in trouble. Because of what you, have, what you said, I have no rest. And that was Shehu Yaradwa. The last incident was the incident he and I had because before we were actually clamped into prison, we were in Kirikiri together. And think for two or four nights, uh, three or four nights, we were together. And the, one of the things he told me was that, hey, a business concern of his has been taken over by the regime that was in power then. Then I said to him, Shew, if this has happened, that regime is not expecting you to come out he said, yes, I think so. But when and if I come out, I will get my business back. Fortunately, he didn't come out, but we make sure that the family got that business back. Let me say, with the foundation and the center, the friends colleagues and members of Shehu Yaradua family have kept the faith we have. And I will say at this juncture that all we have to do or all I have to do at this point is thank everybody who had made contribution to where we have taken this foundation and the center to at this stage. The members of the board of trustees, the builders of uh, 
this uh, edifice, those who made the contribution, many of them, to build this edifice, and the staff led by Jack Harris. We thank all of you for the good work that you have done. And especially again, I want to thank the members of the Board of Trustees, and particularly my Vice President, we were walking into this room and said, look, VP, this is part of the sins we committed together. Thank you all. Round of response, uh, uh, applause, sorry. Now we will present a short tribute to the legacy of Shehu Musa Yarabwa. We are proud to be the president of this great country. Shehu Yarabwa was a political titan. A leader, a perfect Nigerian. When he fought for civilian war, he was doing it as an act of service. He wasn't trying to do it to amass power or wealth for himself. He was doing it for the people. If Sherry Ardo was alive today, he would be trying to solve the problem of national cohesion to get people from different tribes and ethnicities to come together as a nation. He would have been able to inspire people to have the courage to vote for the right leaders that will move the nation forward. He should be remembered as a legend. I feel he should be remembered as a great man because he cared about his people. He should be remembered as a hero, as an icon to the people and to the youth. I believe he should be remembered as the true democrat that Nigeria ever had. The best way to remember Shehu Yardwa would be to live by his example, to be selfless and live as one nation. I am pleased to invite His Excellency Atiku Abubakar, GCON, Vice Chairman, Board of Trustees, Yardwa Foundation offer elections. Excellency Baka was elected Vice President of the Nigeria in 1999. He elected 2003. Vice President, he chaired the National Economic Council, which was responsible for assembling the outstanding talent, transformed the Nigerian economy, more than quadrupling. Our GDP between 2000 and 2007. Tiku Abubakar's political career began with Shehu Musa Yaradoa's determination to build a national grassroots political organization in Nigeria. He continues to sustain that formidable platform to this day and is responsible for the establishment of the Yaradoa Center. He is also the founder of American University, Yola. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause for His Excellency Atiku Abubakar, GCON. Thank you very much. Your Excellency, President of Ghana, Nana Kufuado, my boss, President Olusha Gunobasanjo, the President of MacArthur Foundation, the Chief of Staff to the President, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, 
I wish I would have the whole of today to deliver my reflections <clears throat> on the late show. I will still not be satisfied. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor and privilege to welcome you all to our event this morning. I am particularly pleased to welcome His Excellency, former President Olusegun Obasanjo, my boss, and Professor John Paul, President of MacArthur Foundation. Let me also convey our wholehearted welcome to our special guest of honor, His Excellency Nana Akufo-Addo, President of Ghana. We thank you most profoundly for gracing us with your eminent presence and for honoring Nigeria. We are here today to celebrate the 20th anniversary of the commissioning of the Shehu Musayara Dua Center. Over the years, the center has strived to uphold late Tafida's vision of national unity, good governance, and social justice by serving as a hub for policy advocacy, social and civic engagements in Nigeria. I believe we have indeed succeeded in building a center worthy of Sheo Yaradwa's noble spirit. Many of us had the pleasure of knowing Sheo Yaradwa, his patriotism and commitment to Nigeria's unity and peaceful coexistence were some of the remarkable virtues that attracted me to him. I recall my first time meeting the late Major General. He had come to my office to make inquiries about how to obtain an import license. I told him he would have to write an application to the president then, Ibrahim Babangida. He wrote the application as I had advised, thanked me and left. I could only describe him in two words, simple and humble. Later, he came back to me. He said, look, I'm assembling a group of young Nigerians so that we can start a political party to transit to a democratic governance. I had then more than 15 years of service to retire. I immediately wrote my retirement. Not only did I write my retirement, I could not even wait for three months. I paid three months in lieu of retirement to join him. We became friends and later discovered we had a lot in common. We had both been farmers. We both had interest in the maritime business, which my boss just alluded to, and shared a common vision for Nigeria, a democratic Nigeria. Here was a military general who participated in a military dictatorship, let me say. But having come from a political family, his belief in democracy was deep-rooted. His political orientation was always very clear. As chief of staff Surim headquarters, his devotion to the smooth handover of power to civilians in 1979 contributed to the foundation of democracy. My boss had just told you about the formation of his political party. But before then, sir, Mr. President, I remember a meeting of political gladiators from the North 
was holding in Kaduna. Nshehu invited me to accompany him to the meeting. And we got to the meeting. They were all members of the former MPN government, ministers, commissioners, and so on and so forth. And they were all resident in Kaduna. And each and every one of them started talking. Midway, he got up and said, but I know you, all of you are living in Kaduna. Whom are you representing? You have never gone back to your states or to your villages. And you are talking on behalf of these people. And you never consulted them. But because they were his father's contemporaries, they started insulting him. Say, who are you? You are just a young man. How can you come and be telling us this? And then he just tapped me at my shoulder. He said, Raki, I said, get up, let's go. And we left. And that was the beginning of the formation of his grassroots political movement. He said, if you cannot account to the grassroots, you have no business in politics. As a young man, he invited me to join his effort to break the regional siege that every part of this country had been subjected to. For him, that was a major objective. Again, this is a very moving story, which I want to... When he assembled a number of us representing from each state of the Federation, we were all in our 30s. He said to us, what we are about to commence or to begin is a struggle. That struggle may take five years, may take 10, may take 20 or more. He said some of us may not even live to see the achievement of that struggle. And he was one of them who never lived to see that. For him, that was a major objective. So when he died, we conceived the Sheho Musa Yaradwa Foundation to honor his legacy. Again, as my former boss said during his remarks, I remember after Abiola's emergence as the candidate of the SDP in Jaws, where he asked me or rather instructed me to step down for Mko Abiola. I did. I never knew there was a deal between him and Chief Mko Abiola that Mko Abiola was to nominate me as his running mate. I never knew. When that failed, he swore that he would never support MQ Abiola to be president. I was with him. Just like my boss said, there are only two people you could listen to. That was President Obasanjo and his late father. And I moved immediately without letting Shehu know. I moved immediately to President Obasanjo whom I was not quite familiar with. And I told him, look, call Shehu and tell him to work for Abiola so that our party could win. And I pretended I didn't know anything about it. The next thing, Shehu called me from Kaduna. He said, Turaki, I said, yes, sir. He said, pick me with the first flight from Kaduna. I said, yes, sir. So I went and picked him, first flight from Kaduna, drove him to Ota, dropped him at President Obasanjo's house, and I retreated in the background. I remember having had President Obasanjo tell him, Shehu, President Obasanjo, I mean, I mean, MQO may not be the best president, but I want you to go and support him to make sure he wins. Shehu did not say anything. Shehu said, yes, sir.
Then he beckoned on me. He said, Turaki, take me back to the airport. I said, yes, sir. I drove him back to the airport. <coughs> he returned to Kaduna. Unknown to him, I had gone behind again to call his father in Katsina. He said, Mutawali, please call Shehu and tell Shehu not to do antipathy. Again, Mutawali called him, his late father, before he died, and said, Shehu, no matter what, don't do antipathy. He said, yes, sir. So when he came back to Kaduna, he called me. He said, Turaki, I said, yes, sir. He said, okay, call the leaders of our entire political structure. In fact, he tell late Boris Shade, tell Boris, who was then the main man, to call all the political coordinators from the states. And Boris called the meeting of all the political coordinators from the states at the federal palace and we now decided that Abiola must win the election. And that was how it happened. So, here we are today at this center where we established and programs and projects to continue and many of Shehu's initiatives for democracy and bridge building. The late Shehu Yardua was known as a bridge builder. He constructed bridges of understanding based on equity and social justice to dissuade mistrust among the people of this nation. The unfinished bridge outside there a couple of days ago, I took some politicians around the unfinished bridge. I said, look, this is Shehu's unfinished bridge. We have to continue building those bridges across this country. <laughs> the unfinished bridge here, the Yeradwa Center stands as a testament for the need to continue what he started. Building bridges of understanding and unity across this country. She who really believed in good governance, transparency, accountability, and social justice. He was not a timid Democrat who abandoned his beliefs because of fear or opportunities, political survival. Here again, I want to give an illustration. We were at the Constitutional Conference, 19. 93, 94 together. And we have passed this resolution that a bacha must hand over power in 1st of January, I believe, then 1996 or so. That did not go well with a bacha. That did not go well with a bacha. Abacha sent for me in the night, midnight. Abacha never walked until around 1 or 2 a.m. And I came to the state house. And he said to me, Traki, I want you to leave Shehu and come and walk with me. I said, no, Mr. President or Mr. Head of State. My relationship with Shehu is different. Tell me what you want in the Constitutional Conference. After that meeting, I got an information that both Shehu and I were to be picked. And if we were picked, we would never come out of jail. So I ran to him. I told him, I said, sir, I have this credible information. Two of us were going to be picked. And if we were picked, we will not survive. He said, what do you suggest? I said, let's pretend we are going to Umrah, let's go to London, and from London, let's, <laughs> and from London, we go to Umrah. He said to me, to Raki, that we are about to have recess. I said, sir, we should not 
stay anymore. He said, okay, you go ahead. I will meet you. I left immediately. I boarded, I boarded the aircraft and left for London. On getting to London, two days after I got to London, before even proceeding to Saudi Arabia, I got a call from Nigeria. She who had been arrested. I knew he was not going to come out. And I rushed back to Nigeria myself and started the struggle of how we could get Shehu and <clears throat> President Obasanjo out of jail. And of course, during his jail terms, we visited him. And when we visited him in Port Harcourt, he told us that he had been injected with a poison. As soon as I got that information, I sent a message to President Obasanjo in Yola prison. I said, somebody is coming, a military doctor is coming to see you in the prison. Make sure he did not see you. And I know the president knows about that. He was not a timid Democrat who abandoned his beliefs because of fear or opportunistic survival. He believed in this country and never doubted that Nigeria is destined for greatness. During the 1994-95 National Constitutional Conference, the late Tafida was among the few voices that told General Abacha to prepare a transition program within the shortest possible time. Shehu's greatest gift was his capacity to get things done by bringing people together from diverse backgrounds and ideological persuasions. He was a fantastic listener and a strong believer in dialogue. He was an extraordinary man with an extraordinary capacity for selflessness, tolerance, patience, and large-heartedness. And that's why we lost him. God knows the best. Our work remains undone, but we must stand firm, united and determined to realize his vision for the nation. We must continue to ensure that the ideals Shehu lived and died for are not in vain. We must trust that the Shehu Musa Yaradua Center will continue to stand as a symbol of unity in Nigeria and that the unfinished bridge will continue to serve as a reminder for the need to continue his work to build bridges across the various divides. We hope you will continue to support the center and gain inspiration from Tafida's life of service. Thank you and God bless you. Another round of applause. Over the past 15 years, the Yaradua Foundation's public policy initiative has made substantial contributions to promote good governance and inclusive prosperity in Nigeria. The next video highlights some of these achievements. Draw Foundation has established a track record of effective advocacy as a thought leader and premier platform for policy and citizen engagement in Nigeria. In 2010, the Public Policy Initiative was inaugurated to encourage sustainable public policy through conferences, roundtable discussions, publications, and investment in the use of new media as a tool for driving good governance. Focus areas include credible elections, resource governance, climate advocacy, gender justice, and governance and accountability.
lot's happening in social media in Nigeria. And pushing it towards improved governments will be very important. I want to encourage you because I think the impact you can have will be incredible. The foundation pioneered the use of social media to observe elections in 2011. And in May 2012, hosted the New Media and Governance Conference, the first of its kind on the African continent. Since then, the Yarodra Foundation has continued to champion the use of civic technologies and initiatives to address Nigeria's governance challenges. In 2019, the Content Aggregation System for Elections was adopted by the Office of the National Security Advisor Crisis Center and INEC Situation Room to receive and respond to security threats and process faults. ONSA commended the Foundation for its significant contribution. In 2020, Partners United, a high-value knowledge exchange platform, was deployed to foster a community of practice around accountability in Nigeria. Pro-accountability actors have been empowered with advocacy tools to drive public conversations to combat corruption. The forest cover in Nigeria is less than 10% of what it used to be. The Foundation's climate advocacy has raised the profile of national and international discourse on climate change in Nigeria. Two multiple award-winning documentaries, Nowhere to Run and Swallow, were broadcast nationwide and screened in the US, UK, and a number of European countries. In line with its commitment to create platforms for dialogue, the foundation hosted memory and nation building, Biafra 50 years after. It was the first national convening with participation of the federal government since the end of the civil war. The resource governance program engages citizens and stakeholders with factual and credible information on Nigeria's oil sector to promote accountability and sustainable policy making. Messaging and communication supports demand-driven accountability by amplifying the impact and effectiveness of civil society activists and organizations. I Am Not Corrupt sparked conversations on social media and had a profound impact on target audiences. The video went viral with over 2 million views in the first week of its release and was shared and amplified by Nigeria's top bloggers and celebrities. The Human Rights Incident Management Platform was developed for the National Human Rights Commission to effectively investigate and document incidents of human rights abuses of Nigerian citizens. As a member of the Risk Communication and Community Engagement Committee of the Presidential Task Force on COVID-19, the Foundation championed the hashtag COVID-19 Stops With Me campaign in partnership with USAID. The campaign engaged over 40 million citizens. Collaboration with gender rights stakeholders across Nigeria has promoted the establishment of safe spaces for women. Technical assistance to partner universities, American University of Nigeria, Bayero University Kano, University of Nigeria Unsuka, and the University of Lagos has helped improve their safeguarding practices. Genderjustice.org.ng enables university students to anonymously report and seek justice for sexual harassment or violation without fear of recrimination. The Yaradra Foundation expresses its profound gratitude for the support and encouragement it continues to receive from associates and international development partners. Thank you. It is my pleasure to introduce today's guest speaker, John Palfrey, President, John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation. John Palfrey is president of the John D. Uh, so the, the MacArthur Foundation. He's a well-respected educator, author, 
law professor and innovator with expertise in emerging media. Prior to joining the foundation, he served as head Phillips Academy, Andover, the, school, the only school of its kind to maintain an admissions policy where applicants are judged solely on merit, irrespective of their ability to pay tuition. John serves on the boards of the Beckman Klein Center for Internet and Society and the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT Press. He holds a Jewish doctorate degree from Harvard Law School and a Master's of Philosophy from the University of Cambridge and a Bachelor's degree from Harvard. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome John Palfrey. Good morning. Thank you so much to the Shehu Musa Ya Ardua Foundation for inviting me this morning, and especially to His Excellency Basanjo, the former president, for this invitation, and for all of the opportunity at the MacArthur Foundation to work with you in Nigeria. I acknowledge also the president of Ghana, His Excellency Nana Akufo Addo. Mr. President, it is great honored to be in your presence. Congratulations and thank you also to His Excellency Tiku Abubakar. Thank you for your address. And to the Chief of Staff, Professor, I acknowledge you and also that I have learned so many things today. One of them is the proper role of the Chief of Staff, which is when to kick the President. I will bear that in mind. I would like to start my remarks by congratulating the Aradwa Center on its extraordinary 20 years of driving social and civic engagement for advancing national unity, good governance, and social justice. MacArthur has been a proud supporter of Yar Adua Foundation since 2005. Before I get into my formal remarks, I would also like to take a moment to thank the staff, which has done such extraordinary work. As others have mentioned during this period, we have been so impressed by the decades of service of Jacqueline Ferris and her staff. I would like a round of applause to begin for Jackie Ferris and her great leadership. And to Polly, we welcome you and look forward to your leadership as well. And all protocols observed to the board and other distinguished guests. Your cause and the cause of this foundation and of Shehu Musa Ya'ardua is a cause near and dear to my heart that of the MacArthur Foundation. Before coming to the MacArthur Foundation as its sixth president in 2019, I have spent my career studying and advocating the use of technology to promote democracy and good governance around the world. I am so excited by the opportunities in a world led by all of you in Ghana and Nigeria to bring about a stronger and deeper democracy. Though I also have great fears about what technology can do in the hands of tyrants, as we are seeing today in Europe. And I feel enormously grateful to have a chance to talk about my, how my colleagues, Dr. Shatima and I, and others at Mark Arthur Foundation, are working alongside all of you to ensure that people's voices are heard, especially in Nigeria, in the halls of power. To that end, I'd like to focus on what philanthropy can do to be more effective partners in strengthening democracy through civic technology, and supporting the organizations, practices, and leaders to meet those needs. I'll talk about the urgent challenges in front of us now and what we are doing at MacArthur Foundation to model these changes. Our mission at MacArthur Foundation is to build a more just, verdant, and peaceful world. We have strived toward that goal, as you have here, for more than 40 years. And I'm proud to say that since our founding, we have been a stalwart champion of institutions such as this one, which are helping to bring about the belief and the actuality that the arc of the moral universe can bend toward justice. MacArthur Foundation is known the world over for its fellows program, now in its fifth decade of honoring exceptionally creative individuals. I would highlight the fellowship of one of my favorite authors, the fellowship we awarded to the notable Nigerian-American Chimamande Ngozi Adichie. 
Equally important are grant making in the areas of peace, justice, the environment, journalism and media, have affected institutions and influential networks around the world with grants in the billions of US dollars. This foundation has also been working in Nigeria for more than 30 years in a variety of fields, including population and reproductive health, higher education, girls' secondary education, criminal justice, and human rights. In 1994, we opened our first office in Ibadan and moved to Abuja in 2000. Since that time, we have been led by Dr. Kole Shatima, the esteemed and indefatigable director of our Africa office and his wonderful team of staff. Dr. Shatima, we honor you today. Of course, the world is vastly different than when the Ya Ardua Center and the MacArthur Foundation's office got started here. We must recognize the way in which these changes have altered our context and together imagine a brighter future. Today, I, I focus on the effects of seismic changes in technology and how all of us, in particular our young people, get our news and information interact with the healthcare system, get jobs, and participate in civic life, such as the upcoming election in 2023. The internet, social media, and our mobile phones have completely transformed communications and touched virtually every aspect of life. And yet, in 2022, so much remains unchanged. So many massive problems remain to be solved. Some of these problems are so entrenched that they are woven into the fabric of our shared experience. Poverty, inequality, climate change, and corruption. These things are true in Nigeria, as well as in the United States and India, where we also have our offices. And it's no secret that these challenges disproportionately affect those who are already among the most marginalized. And that is the hard truth behind why these problems exist. Corruption destroys countries and impoverishes people. A thriving Nigeria, with its rich natural resources, young and growing population, continental leadership, along with Ghana, of course, is one of the most important goals for our world today. And that's why MacArthur Foundation operates here. Our work in Nigeria focuses on reducing corruption by supporting Nigerian-led efforts to promote an atmosphere of accountability, transparency, and good government. With our grantee partners, our work also intends to further gender equity and social inclusion as it advances this larger anti-corruption goal. Those who are most marginalized feel the brunt of corruption's consequences most acutely. So we strive to be attentive in all our work to issues across gender, generation, geography, ability, faith, and ethnicity. Increasingly, the use of technology has become an important, if not indispensable, tool towards improving the governance landscape in Nigeria. Technology enables residents to connect directly with government and enhances the delivery of essential services. Technology also has the potential to advance transparency, accountability, and democratic principles, amplifying the voice of all people. In that respect, I applaud the work of the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, for introducing an array of digital technologies in Nigeria since 2011. These include biometric voter registration, to ensure one person, one vote, the smart card readers for the accreditation of voters, improve safety and security, and more. I credit the Electoral Act of 2022, recently signed into law by His Excellency President Buhari, is a step in the right direction, with major provisions including the early release of funds to INEC, early commencement of campaigns, and the ability for INEC to determine whether results can be transmitted electronically. And recently, with our support, INEC established its first gender and social inclusion department. Globally, civil society organizations are using different tools and technologies adapted for the local context to advocate and campaign for change, make data-driven decisions, and track and monitor the importance of their work. We have supported these collaborative efforts over the last 10 years, with the Yar Adua Foundation playing a key role. Looking back, we are proud to say that these efforts have enhanced the credibility of elections and improved and even saved lives. We also know that even while digital technologies can advance things for good, digital technologies can replica, replicate and magnify discriminatory gender and power dynamics. Disinformation can spread quickly, 
reduce the political and social agency of marginalized people, and lead to real-world violence. This is not unique here to Nigeria, but it is true globally. As we see today in Russia, digital technologies can be used to mislead and misinform people in a time of crisis. My own country, the United States, is in a pitched and partisan battle over dis- and misinformation, voter protection, and election integrity, as you may have read. And while we operate in India, another of the world's largest democracies, we cannot take voter inclusion for granted in any of these countries. As we look ahead to the Nigerian election in 2023, now is the time to build on what we have learned over the last decade of this work, both in Nigeria and elsewhere. The Arajua Foundation, in collaboration with other MacArthur Foundation grantees, is leading the way through the Partners United Against Corruption platform, which provides access to vital tools and resources to enable accountability partners, residents, and civil society stakeholders to inspire collective action against corruption. In addition, we should work to enhance the ability for women, people with disabilities, and young people to get to the polls and to do so safely. I would also like to acknowledge the extraordinary toll of the COVID-19 pandemic, which none of us could have foreseen. Technology has helped us to stay connected in communities and social movements for equality all around the world. But disinformation and inequality have also spread alongside this pandemic. We must acknowledge the disproportionate harm in marginalized communities that COVID-19 have brought. At MacArthur and across the social sector, we join with you to confront this injustice with resolve, and I'm so glad to have some of our philanthropic partners here today, including the Ford Foundation. And while we have proud to be, reason to be proud of the work we have done with our grantees, we cannot be satisfied with what we see around us here today in 2022. If I might bring us to a closing today, for my remarks anyway, a 20th anniversary such as this one for Yar Adua Foundation allows us a chance to celebrate, and we celebrate you today for all that you have done. Yes, we should have a round of applause and celebration for these 20 years. But it too is a chance to reflect on what we've learned over the past two decades and as we look ahead to the future. I think that we have learned that people, networks, and institutions, and at the center of that here in Abuja, I think of the Aratua Foundation, MacArthur Foundation, our foundation partners, and our many grantees here in Nigeria can and do make a difference alongside good governance toward a more just, verdant, and peaceful world. I believe that we have learned also that it is indeed possible to transform our systems, practices, and structures in a fundamental way, to imagine and then use everything we can, including technology, to construct something better. I believe we've learned that technology can, but does not necessarily play a role in supporting the public interest, in bringing about good governance, in making life-saving information available at the right moment, and improving systems of education. And based on these things we've learned, we need to build and deploy technology, as Ya Ardua Foundation has done, that puts the public interest first, with equity and inclusion as a design principle, not as an afterthought. And I believe that we have learned that we can and should imagine and build a new digital electoral infrastructure for the public good together and collaboratively to tackle the root causes of corruption. This is the progress and leadership I imagine we will see in Nigeria and globally. And most important, I believe it is time for a new, dynamic, diverse, inspired group of young people to join us in this work. I have every confidence that this young country led by these newcomers, will help us also to build tomorrow's Nigeria that will serve the many and not the few. Along with the great wisdom that we have heard today, I am so excited to see what we will together design, build, regulate, and remake as structures and a system that badly needs it, in the interest of a more just and inclusive economy and democracies around the world. I'm excited by what is happening in Nigeria, I thank each one of you who is leading this work today, and thank you for your incredible leadership. Congratulations once again to the Ardua Foundation, and we at the MacArthur Foundation look forward to being with you in your next 20 years. Thank you very much.
Um, at this point, I would like to recognize some of the members of the diplomatic community who have uh, graced, graced us with their presence. Today, we have um, Ambassador, uh, no, first of all, we have uh, Professor Ibrahim uh, Gambari. Uh, he's been recognized by His Excellency Lucia Mabasanjo, but I'd like to uh, recognize him again. We have Ambassador Samuel Isopi, the EU ambassador represented by uh, Mr. Paulo Barros Simios. Uh, we have the Honorable Ambassador for, for, for France to Nigeria, Ambassador Emmanuel Blackman. Um, we have uh, the Ambassador uh, Italian Ambassador to Nigeria, Stefano De Leo. Um, we also have Ambassador Lucas Schifele, who's the Deputy Head of Mission, uh, Embassy of Switzerland. We're joined by Ambassador T.D. Mseleku, uh, South African High Commission. Um, we're also uh, joined by a very strong um, Ghanaian contingent. Uh, I would like to recognize Honorable Shirley Ayoko Bochwe, Minister for Foreign Affairs and Regional Integration, Republic of Ghana. Um, Nana Asante Bediator, Executive Secretary to the President of Ghana. I'd like to recognize Honorable Samuel A. Ginapo, Minister of Lands and Natural Resources. Uh, Honorable Albert Khan Dapa, Minister of National Security. Uh, Mr. Fawaz Aliu, Ambassador Samuel Yao Kuma, uh, Ambassador Michael Oforiata, uh, Ghana's Ambassador at Large. We'd also like to recognize Ambassador Stanislas Kamanzi, uh, who's the Ambassador, uh, the, the High Commissioner of Rwanda to Nigeria. And also uh, Mr. Jason Kurie, uh, who is the Human Rights Officer of the US Embassy in Nigeria. Um, next, I'm pleased to introduce uh, Dr. Chichi Anyagolu Okoye, Director for West Africa Ford Foundation, who will offer a goodwill message. Dr. Chichi Anyagolu Okoye is Regional Director of the Ford Foundation, West Africa. Prior to joining Ford, she served as Country Director of Water Aid Nigeria. Among her many accomplishments, was Country Director of Girl Effect, Oxfam in Nigeria and director for the Canadian International Development Agency uh, Program Support Unit. Dr. Anyagolu Okoye sits on the board of a number of citizen sector organizations in Africa. She obtained her bachelor's degree from the University of Nigeria and Soka and master's and PhD degrees in sociology from University College of Cork, Ireland. Please, ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause for Dr. Chichi Anyagolu Okoye. Your Excellency Nana Akufo uh, Ado, President, Republic of Ghana. Your Excellency Chief Olusegun Obasanjo, former President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria and Chairman Board of Trustee, Yaradua Foundation. Your Excellency Atiku Abubakar, former Vice President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria and Vice Chairman Board of Trustees, Yaradua Foundation. Other members of the Yaradua <coughs> Board of Trustees here present. Professor Ibrahim Gambari, Chief of Staff to the President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, the family of Shehu Musa Yaradua, John Palfrey, uh, President MacArthur Foundation, Jackie Faris, uh, Director General of the Yaradua Foundation, representatives of the legislature, ministries and parastatals, members of the diplomatic corps, civil society partners here present, ladies and gentlemen. It is my distinct pleasure to congratulate the board director and uh, staff of the Yardua Foundation for steering this ship for 20 good years. Africa has too many unsung heroes, and it is heartening that the legacy of Shehu Musa Yardua has been kept alive through the work of the foundation. The Ford Foundation has been a partner of the Yaradua Foundation for many years on various projects. And that partnership is one that we are very proud of. 
The quality of your work, the extent of your network, the excellence and brilliance of your convenings, and your boldness in challenging the Nigerian people to dialogue issues otherwise hidden from the fore, yet tearing the country apart is remarkable. A case in point being the audacious conference on Biafra 50 years after and the other one on the end of oil. Through these and many more, you truly honor the legacy of Sheikh Musa Yaradua, who himself was not afraid to speak boldly and speak truth to power and died doing so. On behalf of the Ford Foundation, we wish you many more anniversaries. With your commitment and sincerity, brilliant team of dedicated collegial staff, and strive for excellence, I have no doubt in my mind that the Yaradua Foundation will remain a formal civil society organization in Nigeria for a long time to come. Hopefully, in no distance time, you will also spread to other African countries um, and maybe indeed around the world. Africa needs strong civil society organizations that are credible and accountable and able to proffer African solutions and support the sustenance of effective um, interventions. So the Yaradua Foundation has done that very effectively. Jackie, you have done an excellent job of steering this foundation successfully and gracefully. As you transit, please look back and do return now and again to steer the ship whenever you are needed. I encourage the incoming Director General to maintain the friendships and networks, the office team spirit, and high standards of project delivery. This will guarantee continued and fresh partnerships. Happy anniversary. Long live the Yaradua Foundation. Long live the Federal Republic of Nigeria. God bless everyone. In the first decade of the, uh, the foundation, it hosted programs of commemorations to highlight the Pan-African impact of Shehu Yaradua's life and his legacy. Please enjoy the next presentation. The passing of Shehu Musa Yaradua on December 8, 1997 was an agonizing loss, but his legacy of service and sacrifice on behalf of the nation inspired his family, friends, and colleagues to establish a fitting memorial to his extraordinary strength of character, courage, and leadership. On March 6, 1999, newly elected president, His Excellency Olusha Gomabasanjo, GCFR, and Vice President-elect, His Excellency Atiku Abubaka, GCON, addressed the first annual program of commemoration at Arewa House in Kaduna. Since then, distinguished world leaders have continued to pay tribute to late Shehu Yaradua, attesting to his vision and legacy, continues to inspire solutions to challenges facing the country today. President Nelson Mandela of South Africa served as special guest of honor at the foundation launch in 2000. He spoke to the character of Shehu Yaradua, saying that his aim was not to seize power for the sake of it, but rather to enthrone an enduring democracy in Nigeria. Kenyan President John Kufo presided over the commissioning of the Yaradua Center in 2002. Former Prime Minister Benazir Bhutto of Pakistan delivered an insightful lecture at the opening of the center's library in 2002. 
President Obasanjo referenced this conversation with her earlier that morning when having referred to Shehu Yaradua as his colleague both in the civil war and in political war. She responded, which one is more dangerous? Mozambican President Joachim Chisano presented a thought-provoking address at the launching of the official biography of late Tafida in 2005. He noted Yaradua's commitment to the promotion and protection of democratic values, human rights, social justice and opportunities for all. Subsequent guests of honor have included President Paul Kagame of Rwanda, Liberian President Dr. Ellen Johnson Salif, and former President Benjamin Nkapa of Tanzania, Dr. Jonathan Fanton, President of the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, also addressed that gathering on the topic of full and free development, the case for higher education in Nigeria. Shehu Musa Yaradua Foundation expresses its sincere appreciation for the support and encouragement we have received over these many years from friends and well-wishers. The work of the foundation continues to bear fruit and the Yaradua Center is thriving as a conference facility, research library, exhibition hall and hub for policy advocacy and citizen engagement. Its vision is his vision, a Nigeria united across ethnic and religious divides committed to justice and democracy. I'd like to also recognize uh, the presence of His Excellency Rashid Bauer, High Commissioner of Ghana, Nigeria. And I'm also aware that we have a strong Ghanaian contingent here in the room, uh, the, Ghanaian Association of, uh, the Ghanaian Association in Nigeria. Please, can you stand and wave the flag, please? <laughs> Fantastic. You're welcome. Now it is my honor to welcome to the podium our special guest of honor, His Excellency Nana Akufuado. President of the Republic of Ghana, His Excellency Nana Akufuado, was elected President of the Republic of Ghana in 2017, re-elected in 2021. He previously served as Attorney General from 2001 to 2003, and as Minister for Foreign Affairs from 2003 to 2007 under the John Kufuor-led administration. He currently serves as the Chairman of the Economic Committee of West Africa States, ECOWAS, and serves as chair of the Commonwealth Observer Mission for the South African elections in 2014. President Akufuado studied economics at the University of Ghana. He went on to study law in the UK and was called to the English Bar in 1971 and the Ghana Bar in 1975. In 2016, he was presented with the Mother Teresa Memorial International Award for Social Justice for sacrificing political ambition for the sake of national peace and reconciliation. It's our honor, sir. Chairperson, Vice Chairperson, members of the Board of Trustees, Shehu Sayara Dua Foundation, 
Ghana's Minister for Foreign Affairs and Regional Integration and members of the Ghanaian delegation, Chief of Staff at the Office of the Federal President of Nigeria, the President of the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, the Director for West Africa Ford Foundation, members of the family, Shehu Musa Yaradua, members of the Diplomatic Corps, ladies and gentlemen, must at the outset express my sincere gratitude to the Board of Trustees of the Shehu Musa Yaradua Foundation for the honor of the invitation under the hand of its chairperson, His Excellency Chief Olishugu Obasanjo, former President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, to address such an important assembly of persons who are here to celebrate the life of an outstanding Nigerian patriot on the 20th anniversary of the establishment of this institution, which has been named after him and which is dedicated to the preservation and promotion of the ideals and principles of General Shehu Musaya Radua. It is somewhat fitting and historically appropriate that I should be here as special guest of honor at this ceremony 20 years after my predecessor as MPP president, the second president of the Fourth Republic of Ghana, His Excellency John Ajikun Kufu, in whose government I served as Attorney General and Minister for Foreign Affairs, came here to commission the opening of the center. History has its own ways of working. For me to be here as fifth president of the Fourth Republic of Ghana and the second MPP president on this 20th anniversary. Sheo Yaradua, a contemporary of mine and the president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, His Excellency Muhammad Buhari, was well known to us in Ghana which he visited often in his youth. He belonged to the generation of young West Africans who became involved in the tumultuous events of the early years of independence, including the Nigerian Civil War, when he ended up as brigade commander of the 6th Infantry Brigade of the Federal Army, which was responsible for the capture of Unicha from the Biafran forces. He served under General Muritala Mohammed, in whose regime he became subsequently transport minister. His immersion in Nigerian politics lasted until his death, the high point being the period when he acted as chief of staff, supreme headquarters, in effect number two, to the then military head of state, General Urushegu Obasanjo, who has demonstrated his determination to keep Shehu Yaradua's memory alive. Such a development is to the credit of General Obasanjo, who has exhibited thereby the highest form of loyalty and comradeship. <laughs> Shehu Musa Yaradua's death in prison during the regime of General Abacha remains one of the low points of Nigerian history. He will be remembered for his exemplary patriotism, his commitment to a united Nigeria, and his deep concern for the social and economic de development of the Nigerian people. May so continue to rest in perfect peace in the bosom of the Almighty. But for musicians Shatowale of, Niger of Ghana and Burner Boy of Nigeria, threatening to spark off a diplomatic incident recently. <laughs> Nigeria and Ghana have always been siblings. Even though we quarrel and disagree occasionally, we love each other. Indeed, it always comes as a surprise to realize that we do not have a common border. During the colonial time, there was a lot of interaction between the civilian and military intelligentsia of our two countries. Many of them received their higher education 
in the same institutions in the common imperial center of Great Britain, Oxford, Cambridge, the London School of Economics, Sandhurst, Dartmouth, Cranwell, and the regular annual sporting competition between Achimota School of Ghana and King's College of Nigeria spawned many lifelong relationships. The post-independence era has also maintained and indeed intensified this interaction and intercourse between our two countries. There have also been ugly episodes, like when we expel citizens of each other from our countries, and there are healthier and happier events when we clash in sports. I believe I believe in an encounter on the football field between our two countries remains one of the best in the world. I have no doubt that the 2022 World Cup qualifying matches between our two countries, which begin with a tie in Kumasi tomorrow, will provide another colorful chapter in the annals of the rival. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I've chosen the topic security and development, ECOWAS at the crossroads, because it is so very relevant and appropriate to our times. Emanating from a clear recognition that the countries of West Africa would be a more effective economic bloc and have a stronger political voice if they came together. The Economic Community of West African States ECOWAS was formed in 1975. At the time of its establishment, five of its founding fathers, Gnasimbe Eyadema of Togo, Yakubu Gawan of Nigeria, Matthew Kereku of Benin, Kutu Achampong of Ghana, and Saini Kunche of Niger, were military rulers. One of ECOWAS's initial areas of prime focus was the area of conflict prevention and management. This was because almost all parts of the region, west, south, east, and north, had or were still experiencing conflicts or political instability in one form or the other. These were spawned by bad governance, corruption, inequality and marginalization, unemployment, poverty, amongst others. In 2017, 42 years after its foundation, and for the first time in the history of West Africa, all 15 ECOWAS member states had democratically elected leaders. <laughs> Democracy was on the march, and the ballot, not the bullet, was the preferred way of changing government. This was an indication that democracy, equality of opportunity, and respect for human rights, ideals which have stood the test of time, had now firm, found firm anchor in our body politic. These were exciting times for the region. A few years down the line, West Africa seems to be spiraling back into the dark ages, if I may be so permitted to use the phrase, of insecurity and political instability. We are all concerned about the worsening security situation in the Sahel, with the recurring terrorist attacks in Burkina Faso, Mali, Niger, and Nigeria, potentially extending to the coastal countries of Cote d'Ivoire, Togo, Benin, and Ghana. We're equally concerned about the transitional processes in Mali and Guinea, after the overthrow of their democratically elected leaders in 2020 and 2021, respectively. Burkina, Faso two months ago, joined the sad list of countries which have deposed their elected leaders through a coup d'etat. Despite this gloomy outlook, we have, however, also witnessed recently the conduct of credible, peaceful, and transparent elections in the republics of Capo Verde and the Gambia, which attests to the enduring commitment of the West African peoples 
to make the ECOWAS space a democratic space. The contradiction between the events in Capo Verde and the Gambia and those in Mali, Guinea, and Burkina Faso illustrate the pressing necessity to resolve the dilemma of ECOWAS's future. Will it be democratic, stable, peaceful, or will it would be dogged by continuing bouts of instability and widespread upheavals? It is worth noting that attempts at integration in West Africa will be negatively affected if countries in the region continue to battle with the human security challenges which confront our peoples. No country would want to integrate with the country whose house is on fire. West African integration, the dreams and aspirations of our forebears, cannot be achieved without peace and stability in the region. Efforts must therefore be made to address the root causes of insecurity and instability in their cause, such as underdevelopment, poverty, corruption, inequitable resource access to resources, youth and employment, human rights abuses, climate change, weak law enforcement and governance institutions, and unconstitutional changes of governments. In order to consolidate peace and prevent relapse, into violence as a feature of state management. History teaches us that the transition from insecurity and instability to progress and prosperity in a regional bloc is feasible. Over seven decades ago, on 9th May 1950, a few nations of Europe, in response to a proposal from the then French Foreign Minister Monsieur Robert Schuman embarked on a new journey. When he made the proposal that has today led to the European Union, the European continent was just five years removed from the Second World War, a war that had broken the back of Europe and spilled the blood of so many, including some of our own. Monsieur Schuman and his colleagues in the enterprise, Alcide de Gasperi, Jean Monnet and Conrad Adenauer knew that the European continent that had taken the world to war twice in a generation needed to turn its back on war and embrace peace and development. Aided by the highly innovative Marshall Plan that was launched by America in the immediate post-Second World War years, Europe was gradually rebuilding herself. But the fear remained that unless something extra was put in place, Europe would drift back into war again. Presently, the European Union has a market of 447 million people, or 6% of the world population. The world's fourth largest population after China, India, and Africa. One currency and the free movement of goods, services, and people across 27 countries, albeit with Great Britain, having voted to exit the Union and initiating the processes for Brexit. The EU in 2020 generated a nominal gross domestic product of 17.5 trillion United States dollars, which is the third world largest economy by GDP in the world. Employment of the single currency, the euro, has increased efficiency, lowered the cost of doing business, and improved transparency in pricing. The overall effect has been to transform Europe into a much stronger economic and political player on the world stage. Currently, however, while the EU is central to the lives of Europeans, ECOWAS has not still done enough to impact the lives of most West Africans. And it is not for the lack of plans or even rules and regulations. It is simply that the political will to make integration real has been less evident than in Europe. We are committed to introducing a common currency, the ECHO, but still we have some work to do before it becomes reality. 
We've committed ourselves to a common agricultural policy, the West African power pool, and a common customs tariff regime. On the books, ECOWAS would seem to have the right policies, but the policies are yet to be translated into effective instruments that would have a positive impact on the lives of the 350 million people who live in West Africa in the ECOWAS community. Our problem over the years, I suggest, has been leadership. The implementation of these plans has been left to well-meaning technocrats and bureaucrats. However well-meaning they may be, our region cannot make the bold, transformative changes it needs to make without political leadership. We need leadership that is focused on the region and not just on individual countries. The European Union took off because essentially the political leadership of France and Germany decided to make it work. I am of the firm view that Ghana and Nigeria, the two largest economies in the region, with a great deal of political and historical synergy, must provide that leadership. We must provide the political leadership and passion to translate the ECOWAS dream into reality. We have the numbers, we have the economic muscle, and there I say it, we owe it to the region. COVID has revealed COVID-19 has revealed that no country can afford to go it alone in trying to create wealth, progress, and prosperity for its people. Indeed, the difficulties occasioned by the pandemic, such as strong inflationary pressures, dramatically rising fuel prices, unprecedented volatility of stock markets, and tighter global financing conditions, have been exacerbated even further by the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the geopolitics of the Russian-Ukraine war. Our respective economies have been affected badly by these shocks with the ripple effects felt by all. If there was ever a time to hasten the process of integration in West Africa, now is the time. Ladies and gentlemen, the role of the citizenry in the process of regional, and integra uh, of regional integration is crucial. It is important that the integration process becomes part and parcel of the national conversation in each of the member countries of ECOWAS, and not just a matter to be dealt with by officials and heads of states at meetings and proceedings of ECOWAS. Britain's vote for Brexit, for example, was anchored in deep divides that had been visible and growing for decades. They were spurred on by a force more powerful than any political campaign, currents that had been deeply embedded into the fabric of British society for decades. The populations of West Africa must therefore understand the advantages and the disadvantages of subscribing to a regional grouping as their support for or against the process of regional integration will ultimately determine the level of its success. West Africa has a market of 350 million people, which will extend, expand to 500 million in 20 years. This means that a genuine regional market in West Africa should be in our mutual economic interest, for it will present immense opportunities to bring prosperity to the peoples in our region with hard work, creativity, and enterprise. The time for West African integration is now. It will enhance immeasurably the prospects of dealing decisively with the terrorist groupings that are undermining our collective future. A functioning regional market in West Africa has to be a very fundamental objective 
of all the governments and peoples in the region, an objective that will consolidate the process of structural transformation of our national economies on which we must be engaged. We cannot persist with economic structures that are dependent on the production and export of raw materials if we are to bring prosperity to the mass of our peoples. In this undertaking, Nigerian leadership is absolutely vital. Just as Nigeria, just as Nigerian leadership in the development of the African continental free trade area, whose secretariat is located in Ghana, is a necessary condition for its success. Nigeria has to be the Germany of ECOWAS integration. I made it clear before and during my tenure of office as current chair of ECOWAS that I'm willing to do whatever I can to strengthen the ECOWAS community. It is extremely important for the welfare of the 350 million people of the community that we, the leaders, demonstrate strong political will to make the community an economic and political success and make the project of integration in a democratic community real for a community operating on the basis of a governance system that respects the rule of law, human rights, and the principles of democratic accountability offers the most effective vehicle for mobilizing the great potential and undoubted energies of the West African peoples for rapid economic growth and prosperity. When we think of West Africa and Africa before our individual countries, we're not just being Pan-Africanists, we're being true nationalists because what makes West Africa stronger will make each of our individual countries stronger and more prosperous. And it's time for those of us who believe in regional integration to give enthusiastic support to community decisions and inspire confidence and integrity in the structural organs of ECOWAS. Our people deserve no less, and the dream of prosperity will be within our grasp. I thank President Ulysses Nguru Basanjo, the great Baba, and the Board of Trustees of the Sheihu Musa Yaradwa Foundation once again for the invitation and may in the next 20 years of the foundation be greater than those of the last 20. May God continue to bless Sheihu Musa Yaradwa, the Sheihu Musa Yaradwa Foundation and Center, and us all. And may God bless the peoples of Ghana and Nigeria. I thank you for your attention. In 2005, the foundation traversed Nigeria to select 24 brilliant children as Yaradua Merit Scholars. Their secondary and university education was supported by the foundation. In our final video, a number of these scholars share how the legacy of Shehu Yaradua has impacted their lives. Enjoy. The program has impacted my life in ways I could have never imagined. Aside the fact that it eliminated the financial burden of obtaining a quality education. When I was a little girl, I've always dreamt of uh, studying in a very good school, but my parents couldn't afford it, so we were enrolled in a local primary school. The cost of my education was offset, um, it was paid for in full. What stands out as my most important experience is life as a student in a school I never dreamt of attending. 
and also the moment I was awarded the best graduating student in computer science. Being a scholar has helped me narrow down my career path and has granted me access to the resources that I need to achieve my career goals. Being able to come to the North to study at such a young age exposed me to a different background and helped me to understand the northern part of Nigeria much better. They took me away from the ferocious state of a remote village and made me a qualified petroleum engineer. His personality and quality that inspired me most is that of servant leadership. And with that, I have learned to not just live for myself, but for others. Shehu Mustayaradwa life has been inspiring. It has inspired me to be the best version of myself. It reminds me that regardless of your age, you can achieve anything you want. This is because at a very young age, Shehu became a general in the military. I mean, at the end of it all, the whole education that you have, what you have achieved, what you have learned throughout your experience is to give back to the society, is to help your uh, country, is to um, engage with people to understand their issues, their problems, and then you offer solutions. When I first read about Shiu Yadra's story, especially the sacrifice he made for Nigeria, I knew in my heart that my enthusiasm for development cannot die, and I have to try to participate in the development process of this country. Um, out of the so many wonderful things we know about Shiho, I think to me the ones that stand out the most have been his courage and his relentless determination in fighting for Nigeria's democracy. If every public servant would see service the same way Shiho did, I believe we would go a long way. In his own words, let me quote him. The public service is service to God. That you serve God by serving his creatures. Thank you for your patience. Uh, we're getting to the end of the program very soon. I would like to invite Malam Muta Yardwa, Treasurer, Board of Trustees, Yardwa Foundation, to offer a vote of thanks. Malam uh, Murtala is the eldest son of Ehu Yardwa and served as Minister of State Defense under Good Luck Jonathan Administration. He holds a BSc degree in Business Management and an MBA in fin Financial Management. Malam Murtala was turbaned. Afidan Katsina in 2002, a traditional title inherited from his late father. Our special guest of honor, the President of the Republic of Ghana, Nana Kufuadu, former President of the Republic of Nigeria, Chief Olisha Mwabasinjo, Former Vice President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, Elijah Chief Bakar. Chief of Staff to the President, Professor Ibrahim Gambari. Professor John Palfrey, President of the MacArthur Foundation. Members of the Board of Trustees. Members of the legislatures, past and present. Former Governors. Members of the Diplomatic Corps. Royal Fathers civil society organizations, members of the press, invited guests, ladies and gentlemen. Let me start by giving all glory to the Almighty for making this occasion the 20th anniversary of the commissioning of the Air Address Center for resounding success. The Board of Trustees found it, found it wise to entrust me with the word of thanks. 
I hope I do it justice. On behalf of the Chairman, the Board of Trustees, my mother, Hajar Binti Aradwa, who couldn't be here with us today, the family of Sheikh Musa Aradwa, I express our profound and most sincere gratitude to all of you for honoring our invitation. First and foremost, I would like to thank our special guest of honor, His Excellency Nana Kufuado, President of the Republic of Ghana, who, despite his numerous and rather tight schedule, has found, it, has found time to grace this occasion personally. <laughs> Sir, I would like to take this opportunity to wish you a very belated 65th Independence Day anniversary. Your Excellency, sir, I would like to seek your indulgence for a minute or two to present you with a little token of our appreciation. Jackie, to present. Your Excellency, sir, I would like to say, sir, that this has nothing to do with the very friendly World Cup qualifier taking place in Kumasi tomorrow. <laughs> May I also thank the guest speaker of this occasion, Professor Palfrey, the president of John D. and MacArthur T. Uh, John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation. We appreciate your unalloyed confidence and support for the foundation. We, are, we appreciate your coming to speak on this occasion. And, sir, we'd also like to present you with a little token of our appreciation as well. The Eradua Foundation is particularly grateful to Dr. Chichi. Anyangulu Okoye, Regional Director of the Ford Foundation, and Dr. Kole Shatima, Director of the MacArthur Foundation Africa Office, who have been our closest friends, supporters, advisors over the years. We also owe a great debt of gratitude to the European Union, the United Kingdom Agency for International Development, Open Society Foundation, Office of National Security Advisor, the Independent National Electoral Commission, Facility for Oil Sector Transformation, Trust Africa and Luminate, whose continuous support has been instrumental in sustaining the Foundation's programs and projects. We look forward to continuing these important partnerships as we work to promote national cohesion, good governance and social justice in Nigeria. Our thanks also goes out to the Royal Fathers here present, captains of industry, leaders of religious organizations, governmental and non-governmental organizations, and members of the diplomatic corps. Without your support and encouragement, the Sheikh Musa Area Foundation would not have achieved so much within a short time. We cannot but recognize with gratitude the invaluable DG of the foundation and her staff. We would, what we see today is a culmination of the tireless efforts of the foundation under her able direction. Thank you very much. We would like to thank each and every one of you, public spirited Nigerians, who have supported the center from the very beginning. Those who have contributed through cash and kind, traveling from afar every year to grace this occasion. We are also mindful of regulars and cousins of newcomers. We remain grateful to all. We implore you to keep faith in us and continue to support the center as you have always done. This is something our late father will have been proud of. And may the Almighty reward you all abundantly. If I've managed to leave anyone out, please bear in mind that it's because 
I treasure you the most. I wish you all God's protection, join his mercies to your various destinations. Thank you and God bless. Um, just after the closing prayer, I would like to crave your indulgence to just remain seated. Uh, those in the front row would have a picture with His Excellency, uh, the President of the Republic of Ghana, and His Excellency, Olusha Gwambasanjo, right on the podium here. And then um, we will close the event. I have the pleasure of inviting High Chief Senator Ben Obi to lead us in the closing prayer. Senator Ben Obi is a distinguished senator of the Federal Republic of Nigeria and a one-time special advisor on inter-party affairs to the President of Nigeria. Senator Ben Obi, ben Obi was chairman Senate Committee on Air Force and was a member of the Senate Committees on Power and Steel, Foreign Affairs, Commerce, Finance, and also a member uh, of the Committee on Integration and Cooperation in Africa. He is the chairman of the board of America University of Nigeria, Yola. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause. Let us pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Our Father in heaven, the three in one God, omnipotent, omnipresent in science, God, the creator of the universe. Father, we want to thank you for the successful outing we had today, the 20th anniversary of the Yadabra Foundation and Center. Father, I want to thank you for the board of trustees, management, and staff. Father, we want to thank you for the special guest of honor and his delegation, His Excellency Nana Akufu Ado, the President of the Republic of Ghana. Thank you for Johnny Mercies. We pray that you take him back safely and his delegation. Father Almighty, we want to pray for both Ghana and Nigeria that you bless these two countries. Father Almighty, we also want to pray that you continue to grant that the soul the revolutionary soul of Musa Shewiyara Dua. Let it point to rest in your bosom. Father, as we have come to the end of today's function, take us back to our destination safely. Let peace reign in our country. Let good, good, good relationship continue to strive in this country. Father, we ask you to take control of the situation. Bless us individually and collectively. This we ask in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Hi, Chief. Hi, Chief. Stay on the stage. Um, I would like to invite our special guests and board members uh, to join Senator Obi on stage for a group photograph. Thank you.
Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Please remain seated. Please remain seated. Uh, our very special guests will leave, and then thereafter we, we can exit. Thank you.